Today's presentation is Simulating Viral Dynamics in the New Trial Simulator. Today's speaker is Dr. Bill Poland. Bill joined Sertara in 1998. He has expertise in trial and program design for hepatitis C virus, HIV, and other therapeutic areas using integrated treatment adherence, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic, and trial models. His research interests include practical viral dynamic modeling, portfolio optimization, and Bayesian adaptive program design. Bill has a PhD in engineering and economic systems from Stanford University. Bill, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. Thank you all for, thank you all for joining me. We could talk the whole hour just about viral dynamics or just about implementation and trial simulator. Uh, instead, I'd like to assume you're at least a little familiar with each and do some of both. I think before we get started, though, let's uh, have Suzanne do, take two quick polls so we can get to know something about each other. Suzanne? Well, that was quick. Somebody already has uh, put in a few, a few responses. Thank you. Uh, just are you industry, academia, government? Uh, and we'll wait a moment so that people can respond. And uh, this is sort of warm up. Uh, and then we'll get uh, a second question about your interests. But first, let's just wait a moment while people get set up. And we gather a few more responses. Well, the numbers are on industry are climbing. Uh, I wish I had said form industry, other industry, but I think it's uh, I think it's pharma ninety percent. Um, and uh, a little bit of academia, and we'll see about government. Okay, maybe just ten more seconds. This is really more of a warm up. Pretty good. So industry wins, and that's what I expected. Uh, so uh, maybe you can slip in your responses uh, still, but let me just describe the second question, which is your main interest today. And the choices, and by the way, you can choose more than one, are uh, what, you know, what are you most interested in learning about? Is it viral dynamics in general, HCV, HIV, the hepatitis B? Uh, cytomegalovirus, uh, RSV, flu, other? Or is it on the trial simulator side, just how to get uh, the software to, to do this modeling? So let's uh, uh, see where people's interests lie. And I'd like to be able to say that if everybody's interested in one particular thing, that I talk only about that. But I don't, uh, I can't quite do that. But I'll uh, try to try to show uh, a little more interest in the, in the areas that you're most interested in. Well, this is interesting. So there's a lot of interest in, in getting the uh, trial simulator to work. And if we had more time, I'd love to find out you know, who's uh, tried it, maybe um, had some difficulties, uh, or maybe they've, they've, got, they've done other models, but the viral dynamics is particularly difficult. And I'll remind you that uh, there are both training videos uh, on our Sertara website and, and the manuals that come with TS, which I think are quite nice, uh, uh, and online help, uh, which have gotten me through a lot, of, uh, a lot of difficult questions that I've had over the years. Okay, um, so it's, it is a fairly uh, even split among three areas, but um, interestingly, HIV is, is a hot area. Now, I, I would have thought it would be more HBV these days. Uh, HIV is sort of stable. Uh, we've got some extremely effective regimens. Unfortunately, you have to take them for life, but uh, other than that, they're pretty good. Um, and well, fortunately, I have uh, a, one of the demos is the HIV model. And uh, also, fortunately, uh, they're all very similar. OK, uh, so let's, let's continue uh, and move right on 
to, I think I have control now, so let me advance to to the uh, agenda. There it is. So here's what I've planned, how basic viral dynamics works and integration with adherence, PK, and trial modeling, how simulation, including all these models, can support antiviral development, as well as tips for simulation and trial simulator. The two demos, uh, maybe the HCV one a little longer, and then the HIV one mainly to show adherence. And there should be, if all goes smoothly, uh, plenty of time for Q&A. Surprisingly, we can use very similar models for HCV, HIV, HPV, and other viruses such as CMV. <clears throat> In each case, we can use the concept of reproductive ratio. We can model combination treatment. We can model resistant viral strains, which outcompete the wild type under the selective pressure of treatment. We can incorporate adherence effects, that is, missed or late doses, which can allow resistance to develop, especially for drugs with the shorter half-lives. We can make bands around expected responses to reflect uncertainty. And at least for HCV, we can incorporate a threshold for cure. So let's look at the basic viral dynamics, uh, sometimes called predator-prey viral dynamics. And each node here represents a differential equation. For example, in the middle, that dv dt equals uh, a production rate P times I, the infected cells, minus C times the, the level of virus. Except drugs may reduce P by a factor, in this case, uh, eta, that's the horizontal brick wall. For hepatocytes, we can avoid a differential equation for uninfected cells U by assuming the liver regenerates quickly, and so the total liver cells are a constant T0. So we would have U plus I equals T0 instead of um, a DUDT equation, which we could also use, um, and in, in fact, we would use for uh, HIV. The infection rate is proportional to U times V, which makes the equations nonlinear with no closed form solution. So that you see the beta UV there, um, and that forces uh, us to solve the equations numerically. For initial conditions, we assume that the infected cells and virus are at pretreatment equilibrium. So we set the differential equations to zero and solve for V of zero and I of zero. The results are quite simple in terms of the reproductive ratio R zero, which is defined on the second to last line here. And if and only if that R zero is less than one, the solution reduces to no virus and no infected cells, all uninfected cells. So one is the critical value for R zero. And if people are more interested, I have a backup slide giving the, uh, the initial condition calculations and some more detail. Also, resistant strains, which, uh, which we can uh, easily incorporate into this framework. Now, there are many possible elaborations, of course. So here's a few uh, examples. The viral load threshold for cure in HCV. More types of infected cells in HIV, so latent and the long-lived infected. We can observe levels of the HBS ag particles, which pour out of the hepatocytes infected by HBV, and use those to improve uh, our estimation. And there are different sites of action as well for the HBV drugs. Uh, the clearances may, may be reduced, it seems. And in all diseases, there's resistant viral strains, as I mentioned, and then immune responses over time, which can get very complex uh, and may, may be more or less important in each disease area. It turns out, I think, in HIV and HCV that they're less important, but in other areas, I don't know. Uh, and I have some suggested references at the bottom. I especially like the Perelson uh, uh, references because they're uh, they're very friendly compared to some of the uh, more academic literature. Okay, let's talk about uh, how we how we do this modeling. And the first first is the concept of integrating the models: uh, adherence on the left, PK, PD, and trial outcome on the right. 
This helps us improve our planning of antiviral development because these components interact, and it may not be clear which are critical until we've modeled them all together. On the left, we have prescribed doses entering an adherence model and actual doses come out. So we account for imperfect adherence at three levels, the between subject variability, the within subject clustering versus missed uh, random misses, and the within subject dose timing error. Then a PK model translates doses to concentrations over time for each patient, typically a compartmental model with variability. Concentrations then drive viral inhibition, typically uh, specified as a sigmoid Emax model or just an Emax model. And then it turns out not inhibition, but one minus inhibition is the more convenient thing to use. Uh, one minus inhibition multiplies the viral birth rate and or the viral infection rate in our equations for target cells and virus. And finally, we simulate many patients representing a trial or a population and gather statistics like the proportion achieving some criterion for response. And of course, we can also model dropouts. So we'll have an intent to treat measure uh, accounting for the dropouts. And uh, that could even be done together with adherence, recognizing a relationship between uh, adverse events, dropouts, and adherence. So with an integrated model, uh, we can support antiviral drug development by, here's some ways, characterizing dose response, both short-term monotherapy and long-term combination therapy, testing different dose frequencies, drug combinations, durations of treatment, and patient populations, seeing how response varies with the dimensions of adherence, which we'll talk about, testing response-guided treatment, like stopping early in anticipation of either success or futility, and then checking the results against those without the early stopping, and finally simulating the probability of success for any specified trial design. Okay, now let's look at modeling adherence. So here's an example of adherence to a three times a day drug. For this patient, the overall adherence is only 53%. We can model the overall adherence with the between subject variability, BSV, clustering of missed doses into drug holidays and dose timing error, uh, as you can see with the little uh, up and down arrow. Then we can see how important each factor is to the long-term response. Now, the, the between subject variability may be high but we can go to the literature and get some help. Uh, so here we have a, a number of uh, a number of studies, uh, at, well, individual subjects, uh, and we can see the cumulative fraction of patients with different levels uh, of adherence, and see if we can fit uh, a parametric distribution to these. Naturally. Uh, the starting point would be to match the mean and the standard deviation of the data. Now, the beta distribution is convenient because it's already uh, in, uh, has a domain of zero to one. Uh, and so there are equations that relate the mean and standard deviation to the, uh, uh, the two parameters of the beta. And uh, so we can uh, make a fit to a beta and we can even approximate the variance as a function of the mean based on adherence results across different studies. Uh, so we can characterize population adherence with a single parameter, just the mean. And I have a backup slide on this if people are interested. And we'll also uh, briefly glimpse it in the trial simulator demo number two. Now, uh, how do we model this within subject variability? Well, trial simulator has built in a two coin model. <clears throat> so if the subject takes their last dose, the probability of taking the next dose is some quantity P that you specify. And if they miss their last dose, it's one minus Q. If these two quantities are equal, this reduces to a one coin model because we have no dependence on whether or not they took their last dose. Uh, so then you can see we can calculate the average adherence and uh, make sure that's what we want. And we also have in trial simulator an input for any uh, drug that's dosed, we can provide a dose timing error, which can be set 
up as a normal or any continuous distribution. Uh, typically, you'd use a mean of zero. And we'll see that briefly as well in, in a demo. So then let's put it together in trial simulator. And what do we get? We can see the effects of taking, taking doses and missing doses on the drug concentrations and ultimately on the, uh, the response measure, in this case, viral load. So here we see a patient's viral load rise after the patient misses four doses and then start to recover. And in the big picture, uh, we can do an analysis of the impact of adherence on, uh, that's on the x-axis, on 48-week success rate on the y-axis for, in this case, two HIV combination treatments, one with long half-life drugs in blue and the other with short half-life drugs in orange. And we see, of course, response improves with the overall average adherence, but it more, improves more steeply for the short half-lives and the dashed curves show that clustered misses, that is drug holidays, greatly reduce the success rate for any given overall adherence. Okay, now let's look at modeling exposure. The gold standard is a, is a full PK model driving the viral inhibition, but the problem is this runs very slowly because PK models tend to have shorter time scales. Also note that uh, plasma PK wouldn't be helpful anyway when the drugs work intracellularly, like the hepatitis drugs and the NRTIs and HIV. But equivalent concentration, uh, constant concentration, or ECC, is a nice compromise between full PKA and just using dose as the exposure measure. ECC is the concentration providing the same average effect as a true time varying concentration. And this can reduce runtimes in order of magnitude, but it isn't always appropriate. If adherence is important, it may be a lot simpler to reflect missed and late doses with a full PK model, depending on uh, how complex the adherence modeling that we want to do. Uh, it turns out, actually, we can approximate the effect of missed doses on ECC, and I can provide more detail to people who are interested. Um, but one also must be careful using ECC with drug combinations because by default we might use a separate ECC for each drug. And if the PK profiles are complementary, uh, we would miss those benefits because those complementary profiles could flatten the total viral inhibition profile. Uh, and flat inhibition is the most efficient at suppressing virus. And we wouldn't see that if we just uh, have separate ECCs for each drug. So instead, we would want to calculate the combined viral inhibition from the combination and then calculate ECC from that. Speaking of calculating ECC, let's just take a quick look at how it's calculated. Here we have a concentration profile for a BID drug in blue using the left axis and the corresponding Emax viral inhibition for some IC50 in black on the right axis. To calculate ECC, we just find the average viral inhibition, which is the horizontal black dashed line, and then look up the corresponding concentration by following the vertical arrow down to the concentration curve. Here we see that the ECC is below the average concentration, which is uh, the dotted blue line uh, in the middle there, but it's above the C-min. And in general, ECC is always between CMIN and CAV. OK, uh, I note that I can talk more about that if there's uh, questions about it. Uh, I have some backup slides. And uh, before diving into the demos, I want to spend a couple of slides with some simulation tricks of the trade in no particular order. And uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we can set the initial conditions for our viral dynamics by assuming equilibrium pretreatment. Just set the differential equations to zero and solve, and out comes some nice pretreatment equilibrium. Uh, you can always run the model, uh, simulate uh, for a few periods pretreatment, and make sure that the number of uh, cells and virus is stable uh, before treatment, and that shows that you got your uh, pretreatment equilibrium correct. Uh, another trick is to estimate the reproductive ratio and back out some other parameter. This isn't necessary, and in 
maybe it's a complication, but I like it because I think of the reproductive ratio as fundamental, um, and I want to see, uh, I want to estimate it. Uh, but I do have to put a lower bound of one on it because otherwise uh, subjects uh, whose reproductive ratio pre-treatment is below one would never know that they were a patient uh, because they, they're self-curing. Uh, summarize the PK with the ECC only if it's supplied as an input. Otherwise, use full PK. And in fact, uh, that's what uh, we had done in the second demo. Uh, we may not show that, but um, we have full PK models, but we also have ECC override. So you can quickly compare and test the accuracy with the ECC. And in HCV, the, uh, the, the cure threshold we can implement. I do this by turning off the virus growth rate when the level goes below the threshold. And let's see, we can implement adaptive treatment duration with trial simulators action at times block at a specified time, uh, such as eight weeks in HCV, uh, see how we're doing, and then uh, record if the viral load is below the target uh, at the time of the check by subject. So we can then do futility failures uh, uh, and we'll just, for simplicity, simulate them out to the end of treatment, but they're marked as failures. And we can easily check if the futility rule is working well by comparing response with and without it. Now, it's very important, especially with this nonlinear viral dynamics, to explore solution methods. Uh, that's the simulation run options in trial simulator. And I found that Euler's method with the about one hour step size is both faster and more accurate than the default automatic step size method uh, with the viral dynamics, but uh, when we in include the full PK, the default method actually does better than the Euler method. Um, so I would definitely uh, try Euler with diff different step sizes, make sure results are stable, and then you can try the adaptive default, which is um, safer in a way because uh, it, it will reduce the step size as far as needed automatically uh, to see if uh, that's working well or not. And lastly, let's uh, note we can find the population or trial response rates as the means of binary success variables by subject. And those can be calculated by the analysis plan page in TS, which we'll see in a moment. Now, as a modeler, I'm often asked how much confidence we should have in model predictions. One way to answer that is to calculate a confidence band around results reflecting the parameter estimate uncertainty. So this may come from Phoenix or non-MEM or other estimation software. Trial Simulator makes it easy to do this. Um, of course, there are other sources of uncertainty, such as the model structure itself. But in principle, anyway, we could capture that in a similar way. So what we do is set up an outer loop over what Trial Sim Simulator calls replicates and use those to represent different model instances, by which I mean different sets of input parameters. So if we have m replicates and each using n subjects, we'd have m times n total subjects. For example, 200 times 100 would be 20,000 total subjects. And that still may not be enough, so this is going to be slow. I wish to see research on how to optimize m and n uh, but I do find that for large M, one can reduce N below what one would use with a, just a single replicate. Then we can summarize our usual mean response calculation with statistics across replicates, such as the 5th through 95th percentiles. And uh, implementation tip is to provide a switch to turn off the random parameter modifiers, or else any single replicate would use random parameters, not, not the base values. The parameter modifiers are what TS calls study level uncertainty because they change with each replicate, not subject. And then we use trial simulators descriptive statistics to calculate percentiles as I uh, will try to illustrate in the demo. So just uh, one last thing before demos, here's three screenshots from TS to show this implementation, um, which I can also show in the demo, but in case I run out of time, let's take a look here. Uh, on the upper left, we have um, this is uh, the variable we have uh, 
a block for parameter uncertainty. Uh, and we have our zero molt at the level of steady. That's the red oval on the left. And on the right, uh, we see our zero molt is log normal with a median of one and the SD of log is an input, and that's the uh, red oval on the right. And then at the bottom, this R0 multi multiplies the actual R0 if the switch unc UNC is non-zero. And I'm s that's pretty small, but uh, there's a question mark and colon, which is just the, an if-then-else expression in trial simulator. OK, with that. I think we can dive into uh, some demos. And so let me see if I can pull up an HCV demo for you. So this is a quick check. Suzanne, is my, uh, is my HCV model showing up? Sure is. Great, thanks. Okay. So this is a two-strain, two-drug HCV model. Uh, it was originally used to look at dose response for uh, a direct, a novel direct-acting antiviral uh, and to look at parameter uncertainty. Uh, and we'll just look at a few highlights. This is the drug model window where you specify the viral dynamics and, and the PK and adherence and trial outcome. Uh, and you see there's two drugs. Uh, there's actually no PK or even ECC in this model. We just use the dose one and dose two directly in the differential equations. Uh, and there's a block for that. And these are custom differential equations. So it'll be rather complicated. I didn't hold back. This is a real model. Uh, but in a simpler model, we wouldn't need any code. Uh, maybe just we would use uh, the built-in Emacs block, and there's a built-in effect compartment block, and we'd have some little uh, wires coming in, and we'd be done. But here, uh, we can enter our custom calculation. So the top of this window has the initial conditions. The middle section has the supporting calculations in trial simulators C-like language. And the bottom has the differential equations. You can see the equations here for um, in infect, uh Infected cells wild type, infected cells mutant, virus wild type, and uh, virus mutant. And I can't resist showing you uh, one neat feature. So there's, uh, if, if I make a typo or, or uh, any kind of error in these equations, something happens right away. Um, if I put up, uh, actually, a pound is a common symbol, but let me make that an X. Uh, immediately, a little errors box pops up, and if I click on it, it'll tell me about my error. And so I know I broke my model if I keep an eye on this little box, and uh, it'll tell me when I fixed it right away. So it's continuously sweeping the code and making sure it's, uh, it makes sense. Of course, when you start to build a model, maybe uh, it'll just say errors, and then as you start to uh, get something that pa version one that should work, you can. Uh, use that to help figure out uh, where you might have an error. Now, uh, I won't go through this code other than just to point out maybe one thing. Uh, we have a switch here called Molt switch. And uh, so when this is off, the drugs are combined additively. And that's done by summing dose over D50, actually raised to a hill coefficient. Uh, but otherwise, the drugs are combined multiplicatively, done by multiplying the uh, 1 minus inhibition factors. OK, with that, I'm going to uh, look at some other blocks and other parts of TS. Uh, I'd like to show you, so uh, of course, you know, inputs like R0 are coming in. Here's R0. So where does that come from? Well, we have some viral dynamics inputs. Here's R0 mead. You can see a little pop up saying it's uh, currently 2.05. And the standard deviation is uh, quite large here. This is a standard deviation of the log, so it's like a CV. Uh, and that goes into a block uh, for a continuous distribution. That's this one. And uh, R0 is the first one. And if I click on continuous, uh, I can see that one and some others. 
So R0 is given a median of R0 mead times that expression for parameter uncertainty, which since unc is currently, uh, let's see, switches, uh, unc is currently zero, it's off, so we'll just get R0 mead. And uh, here's that input standard deviation and the lower bound of 1.001. Let's look at some other things. Uh, let's look at these flags for undetectable and cured. So undetectable here is if the virus, which was output from the differential equations times a, uh, an error factor, uh, observation error factor is less than the limit of detection, which is an input, uh, it'll be set to one. Otherwise zero and cured is somewhat similar with a threshold of one virion in the body. So now we can look at the futility check. So just as each patient's undet flag is one, if the virus is below the limit of detection, um, we have, uh, this is just variables for the futility check, and then uh, the action at times block set undet at futility check uh, sets a variable to uh, the, this is really the undetect flag, uh, but it's only done at a specified time. The number of uh, few check weeks, which is uh, an input set to eight um, in days, it's, uh, it's this time. Uh, so at that particular time, that variable will be set. Just if you're curious, you can also uh, have things happen when a subject or a replicate begins or ends. And so then, Undetectable with futility uh, is, well, if we're uh, after the uh, futility check time point, uh, it'll be the minimum of the undetectable flag currently and the fut check uh, uh, variable. Otherwise, it's just the uh, undetectable flag itself. And cured with futility is uh, done similarly. And we observe those. So now we uh, can use those to determine what happens for if uh, with this futility check. Um, so now let's quickly look at some other pages just to see uh, how, how they work. I'll close this block. This is uh, the objectives page, and it's just a, a giant uh, text box, which I like to use for model documentation, although you can use it to document your study information or whatever. Then treatments shows the two drugs that you set up, uh, and I leave the doses at zero here, although you could put them into uh, the, the dose that you're mostly using. Uh, but I prefer to change the dose under simulation scenarios, as we'll see. Then the observations is just showing when all the observations happen. Uh, so we see this nice, uh, table shows us zero, two weeks, four weeks, and then every four weeks. Um, let's go on to analysis plan. That's here. So th uh, this allows us to summarize uh, our, our input, or rather our outputs. Um, and uh, we set up plans to take the mean of the four binary success flags uh, so we see these methods called unde undetectable frac through cured with fut frac, and I'll just show you one of them. Uh, if I click edit, uh, you can see that what it does is it takes the cured with fut observation by time planned, and it only does one thing with it. It just pulls up the mean. So that's how you find the mean automatically. You could do it manually, but it's nice to set that up so that it's always done for you. And then if we go to simulation scenarios, uh, and we can set this up with any variables with the add property button. Uh, so we have it set up with, uh, we have the doses. Um, we've set them equal, 50 up to 400, and then a couple other cases. Uh, we, can, uh, we can then run a scenario, and let me run this uh, to illustrate. Let's make sure. So it's, it's um, running now, and it ran uh, very quickly. Only three seconds for 400 subjects. That's, that's what you get with 
uh, without full PK. Um, then when you go to simulation results, which I can open here, uh, you get these four predefined tables of, uh, of the uh, summaries. So let's just look at cured with futility frac. And there they are at uh, days zero through 168 or 24 weeks, and we see 78% were, were cured. But let's do something more interesting. Uh, so let's make, how about a spaghetti plot uh, versus subjects? So let's see if I remember how to do this. Um, we'll take, I, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, let's take a new time series grid view, and um, we want to look at the log IU per mil uh, observed. That's the viral load. And so here's all th those results. And let us make a plot. I like line plots. I want to see results by time. Uh, and I want uh, a breakdown by subject. And if I remember correctly, that should give us uh, a very colorful uh, line plot showing the response for each subject results uh, going. So, so zero on a log scale isn't zero. It's it's just uh, one. IU per mil, um, and uh, I think the limit of detection is a little bit over that. So anybody who's uh, undetectable out here on the right end uh, will be a success, and the, and the handful above are the failures up here, and we can see uh, are they approaching a steady state, which, by the way, you could probably calculate from those initial conditions, which are also equilibrium conditions. Uh, what's the equilibrium and see if uh, subjects are approaching that if if they are not cured which uh, which would indicate uh, be indicated by approaching uh, the bottom end of the plot okay so that's uh, the spaghetti plot and I'd like to show one more thing I'd like to show the uncertainty simulation uh, and I've set it up with very small numbers of subjects, only 25 subjects, but 50 replicates. And let's see if this runs in a reasonable length of time. Uh, yeah, it's flying right along. So we're already through uh, 17 replicates. Uh, and as soon as it's done, uh, we'll be able to summarize results. Uh, it's finished. And uh, so Let's look at uh, some interesting output. If I click here, it'll show the tables. Cured with futility is a good one. Uh, but you see we have uh, a lot of results here. So we need to summarize this with, say, some percentiles. So let's do descriptive statistics. Uh, we'll take. Let's take uh, the mean response uh, broken out by time. And we could pick the mean of the mean. Uh, actually, uh, let's, uh, let's do some percentiles and the mean of the mean. Why not? So here's some percentiles. And here's the mean. And let's see if I did the plot. Uh, okay, so there's there's our results, and let's let's make a plot out of it. A line plot is my preference. We're plotting all four of these: mean, p5, p50, and p95. And in order to make them appear on a single plot, I click this one. And we'll plot these versus time. Let's see how that looks. There they are. Uh, the mean and the P50 are very close, except there's some uh, they split a bit, a bit 
towards the end. Uh, that's interesting. And uh, this is the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile of re uh, response. So this gives us some idea of the uncertainty. Um, of course, if we increased the number of uh, subjects and number of replicates, it would tighten up a bit. So that's all I wanted to show you with this demo. And uh, quickly, let's take a look at the other one. Uh, so let me pull that up for you. And the main point of this HIV model uh, is, is adherence modeling. So this is a model with full PK. And uh, in fact, the original version was used to test adherence sensitivity for a new QD antiviral regimen versus a BID regimen. And again, we have two drugs. And uh, drug A is customized on simulation scenarios, has a two compartment PK model, and drug B has a one compartment model because that was enough for uh, NRTIs, it actually represents uh, a pair of drugs. Uh, and these provide the concentrations for the Emax inhibition. And of course, the uh, PK models are easily set up with the trial simulator tools. So you could easily make this a two compartment model if we felt the need and so forth. But let's just look at the adherence variables. We have a population mean, adherence pop mean. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually set to one by default, and you can be sure that in simulation scenarios, we override the one to a more interesting value. Uh, and we have a, an expression for that, um, and th that's uh, 0.999. Let's take a look. Uh, if it's one, we just bring it down to 0.999, and the reason is we're using a continuous distribution, which is beta for adherence by patient. Its mean is the adherence pop mean expression, but betas blow up when uh, the mean is one, so that's why we kept it just a little bit under. And the uh, standard deviation is a f actually a function of the mean, as I had mentioned. It's a decreasing function of the mean, uh, which is in here. But let me go on to dose timing error. Uh, so uh, we have a normal dose timing error uh, which we could feed directly into the dose variables, but we need a trick to make all drugs taken or missed together, both for the dose timing error and for the adherence by patient. Let me uh, show up one of these blocks here. Uh, so you see it, it has inputs for dose timing error, and that's actually fine. Uh, that, that's just the normal. Um, the period here is at least as frequent as the most uh, frequently given uh, drugs to make sure that it's updated, uh, uh, updated at least as often as the uh, dosing, and um, so that goes into uh, the, the the dose block. But we have to set a variable called miss all drugs, and we just set it to uh, one if uh, if they didn't adhere. Uh, which happens with probability one minus it here by patient and zero otherwise. And then that binary variable goes into, uh, into A dose and into B dose, and that ensures that the drugs are taken or missed together uh, with the correct uh, uh, probabilities. Okay, uh, so that was the trick. And now let's look at, uh, let's look at results for some adhere pop means, and I've already done runs here. I forgot to close this uh, for 0.6 through 1.0. In the interest of time, I won't rerun, but I'll show you our simulation results for this variable fraction less than 50 intent to treat. That's less than 50 copies per mil. Uh, and uh, so here are the results for 60 through 100% adherence, which I use, just put in the variable scenario for convenience and plotting. And uh, I won't even recreate the plot, but it's just a few clicks. Here it is. Um, and the, uh, it's, it's done by time val. The uh, later time points are the three curves up top here. You can hardly see the last two, uh, difference between the last two. But uh, we, we see, of course, uh, that adherence helps more at later time points. 
And we could also look at dose timing error sensitivity and many other things. But I will stop the demo here. So I'll have time for just a few more uh, summary points. So hopefully uh, you're back to seeing my uh, slides. And in summary, basic viral dynamics models are similar across diseases. Simulation isn't just for PK models. Uh, it's best really when you integrate uh, across the spectrum, and then you can see uh, where the important uh, parts that need extra attention are. Uh, sometimes, for example, PK isn't important, and you might as well do something very simple for PK, even a dose uh, response model. Uh, TS simplifies model building with the built-in features in all these areas and, uh, and, and the ways that I tried to illustrate this integrated modeling can support better decision making in antiviral drug development. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at Sertara, from whom I learned all uh, the basics of trial simulator and viral dynamics, uh, and also many clients who made it all possible by funding projects, and of course, um, Alan Perelson and colleagues whose uh, models were more implementable than many of uh, the other academic models that I've seen. I'd like to just leave you with uh, this quote, which I find somewhat inspirational, and pause for questions. And I think we have uh, a good 10 minutes left uh, for Q&A. And of course, if you, your question doesn't get answered, feel free to send it anyway, and uh, I'll get back to you later, um, uh, maybe today or tomorrow. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, we have our first question from the audience. Someone would like to know um, if you could talk a little bit about some of the limitations of using the simulator for viral dynamics. Well, um, so I've been using it pretty heavily, so I don't, I won't try to say compare it to other software. Um, and I, I would say one limitation, which I think will be remedied in the uh, near future, mid midterm anyway, is um, the, uh, the simulation is, uh, is your basic Monte Carlo simulation. Now, uh, there's, there are more sophisticated ways to pick your random numbers, like quasi-random quasi numbers and uh, Latin hypercube sampling. And we don't have those options yet. So there's pros and cons. Uh, you can get into trouble with the uh, more advanced methods. Uh, and I think the design decision early on was let's uh, n not give people tools that might uh, get them into trouble. Let's just uh, keep it straight Monte Carlo so that you don't end up with uh, some uh, non-random uh, results that you thought were, were random. Uh, and uh, another uh, factor is just that there, there is a learning curve to trial simulator. Uh, if, uh, if it comes up, I'll, I'll show, I have a slide on uh, TS specific tips, some of which we've actually seen. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so for example, the little uh, errors box telling you when uh, you have an error is very helpful, but it took me a while to notice that uh, I could use that to help me debug models. And also I, uh, I, uh, it took me a while, I sort of dove into, well, I have to do everything custom, but no, actually, we've got built-in Emacs, we've got built-in effect compartment, we can do a lot of models without any coding. Uh, it took me a while, and I, I guess part of that is I didn't go through the training, I just dove in. Let me stop there, let me go on to another question. One of our audience members would like to know, in combination treatment for hepatitis B virus, we no longer see Resistance. So, do we need to model it at all? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, the, these days, the both the HCV and HIV regimens have gotten so good that um, you don't expect to see resistance, except maybe in uh, well, and, and you don't even want to see it in, in your uh, short-term monotherapy for the patient's uh, safety. Uh, so you, you pick uh, study designs where you really don't want to see resistance. 
And if you're fairly confident that you won't see resistance, uh, then I would agree. Uh, you can simplify your model and not worry about the resistance modeling. However, uh, it's nice in silico anyway to push the boundaries and see how low the dose could go before you, you expect to start seeing resistance. And so I, I do think in most cases, you're going to want to model it uh, unless you're focused, if you're working with a novel drug, but if you're focused on some uh, variation uh, on, on a very successful regimen where resistance isn't seen, uh, you may maybe don't have to. Now in HBV, I would, uh, I think we're forging a lot of new territory and uh, we're more likely to need resistance modeling uh, to understand uh, the, the limits of uh, uh, the boundaries uh, at which you reach resistance development. How would you extrapolate doses from in vitro and animal experiments to your first in human studies? Wow. Uh, that's, okay, so that's a big question. Uh, and I, I guess the, my preferred solution, if possible, is to find a benchmark compound for which you have both the animal results uh, or in vitro results and the human results. So some drug that's made it uh, and doesn't even have to be approved, but as long as it's made it into humans uh, and you have some uh, IC50 uh, results, then you can make form what I like to call it in vitro to in vivo scale factor for the IC50s because there's so many uh, ways that those could differ, different assays and different uh, uh, environments, uh, uh, factors that enter into those uh, that in the end is just some, some complicated factor uh, with many hidden latent compartments, shall we say, hidden parts. Um, and uh, if you have that, then you would apply the same. So, so let's say you've got three things. You have um, animal IC50 and human IC50 for the benchmark, and then you have animal IC50 for the new compound. You apply the same scale factor, and uh, you know maybe with uncertainty bounds, and and that would give you at least a uh, ballpark uh, human IC50. So that kind of scaling can be done, and, and you know you could go to the literature uh, to help with uh, scaling. You could do even a, a sort of meta-analysis to try to understand what can we learn from compounds with similar mechanisms uh, that are already approved or have good data. Uh, and, and I guess I'll just mention um, protein binding and other factors are very important. So uh, make sure that you account for those. Uh, when you're looking at, uh, uh, when you're trying to do this sort of benchmarking. Looks like this is our, our last question from the audience. How would you model drug adherence to a weekly or monthly regimen? Okay, so that's much longer term uh, than what we were talking about. So missing a dose is less uh, is less of an issue, and it's it's more uh, being late. So naturally, you'd put much more emphasis on the modeling of the uh, the late doses, uh, the dose timing error. You'd probably uh, spend a lot more time than just a normal around uh, zero uh, for your dose timing error. You could put in different sorts of patterns. So maybe some patients are chronically late, so they're continuously getting further from the original schedule until they actually come back to the original schedule. And uh, so you could model that sort of thing. Or maybe you think that uh, patients are sort of alternating late and early. So, um, you know, they took their dose at a week and a half, but then they caught up with a dose at half a week. Uh, if that's happening, then uh, you could have a more symmetrical distribution. Either way, you know, you can model it. You don't have to have a mean of zero and you, you don't have to have even a, uh, a single type of patient. You could have, uh, you know, TS lets you set up a discrete variable, so you could have patient type as a discrete variable. If it, is it one, two, or three? And depending on that, uh, 
you might have three different uh, distributions for uh, dose timing error, uh, or for that matter, uh, uh, other other adherence variables. But uh, it, yeah, in in general, um, I think that the ability to simulate different patterns. And by the way, there there are tricks to putting in just raw data. If you have adherence patterns, you can feed those in. The ability to simulate those is very valuable, so you can then understand how different uh, adherence patterns uh, uh, will affect response on average for a large sample.